Howdy folks, did you all have a great weekend? Well, forget it because it's Monday. Although, hopefully, this episode of Mills with Jingles will go some way towards making today suck slightly less. I suppose the big news is that yet another bug has been discovered in World of Warships, although, strictly speaking... Well, no, that's, that's actually correct. The bug isn't a new bug. It's been in the game since day one. It's only just been discovered. And the reason for that, well, I should probably explain what the bug is first. So, if you have a ship with particularly rapid firing guns, so some of the high level gunboat destroyers, for example, like HMS Druid or the Japanese Harugamo, for example, ships that have guns that fire so quickly that the reload starts to get down to below two seconds or so. Particularly if you've gone to the trouble of investing in things like captain skills and equipment. That reduced the reload of your guns, things like the basic firing training or the adrenaline rush skill, for example. Uh, what is happening is basically those skills are completely useless and just a waste of points. How can this be? Well, it's all to do with the basic game code. You see, World of Warships only sends refreshes, I suppose is the word you would use, between your game client and the server seven times a second. Now you might think that sounds pretty fast, because it basically means every 0.14 seconds the game is checking to make sure that what you are seeing is what is actually happening. Uh, actually no, I think I got that one backwards. Let's put this another way. Every 0.14 seconds World of Warships is determining what is actually happening and then relaying that information to your game client. Now that might seem pretty quick, and it is, but by the standards of first-person shooters for example, like Counter-Strike Global Offensive, Third-person shooters like Fortnite, it is painfully, painfully slow. But the developers never thought that it was going to be a problem. And to be fair, when the game was released, and for the first few years after release, it wasn't a problem. But it wasn't the first time that a problem related to how often the game sends updates back to your client had become a problem in a Wargaming.net title. Way back when World of Tanks had just released, the T-54 Tier 9 Soviet medium tank, which at the time was the fastest machine in the game, was causing problems which in part were related to the game's fairly primitive early netcode, but also due to how frequently, or as the case may be, infrequently the game was checking for updates. If you were in the unenviable position of having to aim at and shoot a T-54 on the enemy team, well good luck with that, because just because your sights were on the target as far as your client was concerned did not mean that that is actually where the T-54 was. This led to the T-54 in the early years of World of Tanks earning the nickname the UFO, and it wasn't because of the saucer-shaped turret, it was because T-54s, for anybody who wasn't in the T-54, would appear to just rubber band all over the place, making it next to impossible to shoot the little buggers. Improvements to the game's netcode, as well as improvements to the world's actual internet infrastructure, don't forget this was in 2010, this made the problem of the rubber banding T-54s go away, but nothing was actually done to address the underlying issue, which was how infrequently the game server polled the clients of everybody participating in a battle to determine exactly who was where and doing what to who. And the failure to address this problem would come back to bite World of Tanks in the arse a couple of years later when they started introducing machines that were capable of moving even faster than the T-54. And I can clearly remember witnessing the consequences of this myself one day, as I was playing a game of World of Tanks on the Ensk map. I can't remember what tank I was in, but I can clearly remember that I was on the central east-west road in the middle of the town, and on my minimap I could see that an enemy light tank had been spotted, and was about to cross the T-junction heading north to south at the far end of the road that I was on. And my gun happened to be pointed in that direction, so I simply sat there, waited, let the site stabilise, ready to give this light tank the good news. The problem was that, and I don't know the exact figure, but I believe at the time World of Tanks was only checking for the positions of everything four times a second. So every 0.25 seconds the game server would communicate with the clients of everybody taking part in that battle and refresh and update everybody's positions to the game clients of the people taking part in the battle, one of which was me. And what actually happened was that I could see on my minimap this light tank pass into my field of view. Except staring down that road at the T-junction where the minimap was telling me a light tank was, I couldn't see anything. 
until the game client updated a quarter of a second later and showed me a light tank three quarters of the way across this open gap at the end of the road at which point it was way too late for me to do anything about it. So, yeah. To their credit, World of Tanks did implement a fix and updated the rate at which the game server checked everybody's clients to see who was where and doing what to who. What happens now in World of Tanks is that if there's an enemy tank within 50 meters, your game client receives updates on that tank's position from the server every 0.1 seconds. If the enemy's more than 50 meters but less than 150 meters away, it's every 0.5 seconds. If they're more than 150 meters but less than 270 meters, it's every one second. And if they're more than 270 but within 445 meters, the game checks every two seconds. Now, this isn't exactly ideal, although it is a vast improvement on what World of Tanks players had to put up with before. Because at ranges in excess of 270 meters, a tank moving at 72 kilometers an hour can cross 40 meters of distance before the game updates its position. Nevertheless, this was determined to be good enough for World of Tanks. In World of Warships, the updates are done, as we've already said, seven times a second, every 0.14 seconds. Well, hang on a second, Jingles. 0.14 seconds isn't that much slower than World of Tanks updates the positions of everybody within 50 meters of each other. I mean, how bad can that be? Well, that's absolutely fine if all you're doing is checking for people's positions, but that's not all that the game client is doing. In World of Warships, before you were able to actually fire your ship's guns, regardless of how quickly you're stabbing that fire button, a couple of things have to take place. First, your client has to register the fact that the guns have reloaded and then communicate that information to the game server, acknowledge the fact that you're hitting the fire button, and then relay this information back to your game client, in effect giving you permission to fire. And this is not a new thing. This isn't some bug that's got introduced in the latest patch. In fact, technically, it's not really a bug at all. This is just the way World of Warships works. It's the way it has always worked. But the developers never considered that this was going to be a problem. And to be completely fair, for the first couple of years of World of Warships existence, it never was a problem. Until a few years had gone by, and ships started to be introduced that had really, really fast rates of fire. And what's happening, if you do have one of those newer ships with a ridiculously fast rate of fire, if you've taken, for example, the basic firing training skill to buff your rate of fire, if you've taken the adrenaline rush skill to buff your rate of fire once you've taken some damage, is that the skill is actually working exactly as advertised. Your guns are reloading faster, but they're not firing faster because the server only checks whether or not your guns are reloaded every 0.14 seconds. Some of you may have seen Flamu's video on this subject where he demonstrates exactly what's happening and you can clearly see if you look down at the shell counter at the bottom of the screen the guns are reloading very very quickly but there's a noticeable delay even though he's hammering the fire button there is a noticeable delay between the guns loading and the guns receiving permission to fire from the server. In the test that he conducted, he took an HMS Druid with a captain without any skills that buffed the reload of his guns, and over the course of one minute he managed to get off 136 shots. Then he loaded up the same training room again with the same ship, only this time he did it with the captain that did have the basic firing training skill. And over the course of one minute he managed to get off 136 shots. And it wasn't that the skill wasn't working. The skill was working just fine. You could see the guns reloading and waiting for permission to fire before the server said, yep, yeah, your guns are reloaded, go ahead and fire. People initially thought that the problem was an issue with the skills, but no, the skills are fine. You can see the skills working. The problem is with the potato servers waiting to give those loaded guns permission to actually shoot. It's down to the fact that the game only checks seven times a second. It's probably also worth pointing out that Flamu was not the first person to notice this problem. It's just that Flamu was the first person to notice the problem with an audience big enough for Wargaming to care about. Somebody, and I don't know who, actually brought this subject up on either a forum post or a Reddit post quite some time ago, but they didn't have 117,000 subscribers on YouTube and several thousand Twitch followers, so Wargaming just ignored it. But they couldn't ignore Flamu, and it was astonishing how quickly they addressed the issue. Well, they didn't address the issue, they acknowledged it. Actually addressing it is going to take some time. 
And it's not going to be easy, because they're going to have to tinker around with fundamental game code. Apparently it's not just as simple as doing what they did in World of Tanks and increasing the rate at which the server checks and exchanges information with the various different game clients present in the battle. Or maybe it is as simple as that, but they can't, because World of Warships is already doing that as fast as it possibly can, and if they were to increase it any further, the servers would melt down. Who knows? The only thing that we absolutely definitely know for sure right now is that if you do enjoy playing fast reloading gunboat destroyers like HMS Druid, like the Friesland, like the Harugamo for example, do not bother wasting your captain points on skills like the basic firing training skill that buff the reload of your main battery guns, because even though the skill itself works absolutely fine and doing exactly what it says on the tin, buffing the reload of your guns, it's not actually buffing the rate of fire of your guns, because the game's potato code can't handle ships that fire as fast as that. I do have to say, it's amazingly suspicious just how quickly Wargaming came out with, well, not just the acknowledgement of the issue, but the explanation for why the issue was occurring. It's almost as if they already knew this problem existed, but they'd had a discussion a few months or even a few years back that probably went something along the lines of, so how many ships exactly is this going to affect? Well, there's more than 500 ships in the game, it actually affects less than 1%. How likely is it that anybody's going to notice? Well, it's less than 1% of the ships, but the people with those ships don't play them 100% of the time, so we're probably talking an infinitesimal fraction of 1% here. And how much is it going to cost to fix it? Oh, you don't want to know. You're right, I don't. Tell you what, let this one go. We'll worry about it when somebody notices. Actually, no. Hold that thought. Let this one go. And we'll worry about it when somebody with an audience that actually matters notices it. We good? Good. Yeah, I wouldn't have been at all surprised if that was a meeting that had actually taken place. Anyway, that's the situation. Moving on swiftly. I thought I'd take another look at the Saltmines Discord server, because we do actually have a channel there called Mingles with Jingles, which exists solely for the purpose of people posting questions for me to answer in Mingles with Jingles, and I don't do it nearly as often as I should, so we're going to crack on with that now. The first question comes from Tuba, and he, or possibly she, I don't know, wants to know, Mr Jingles, I'm eagerly awaiting the return of Workshop Wednesdays, or whatever days you like to model. What kits do you have stockpiled in your strategic styrene reserve? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, yeah. In the middle of Covid lockdown, I started getting back into figure painting and modelling couple of pictures coming up now of some of the stuff that I did during my extremely brief stab at getting back into the hobby. Basically my circumstances changed and no longer had the dedicated space that I needed uh, for a painting and modeling workshop. Of course all of that is about to change when I move into my new place, hopefully within the next two months, fingers crossed. I'm setting aside one of the bedrooms as a specific recording studio for doing videos and a modelling studio for doing, well, stuff like this. Now, as any self-respecting modeller knows, the pile of stuff that you've gotten done pales into insignificance compared to the pile of stuff that you haven't gotten done yet. They call it the pile of shame. And as piles of shame go, mine isn't actually that bad. I have seen a lot worse. But considering the relatively short span of time where I was actually picking up a paintbrush and cracking models out, the size of the pile is still, in proportion, pretty damn bad. And rather than just list everything, I'll show you some pictures. The pictures are in no particular order, and they're just, well, basically what I can find. I'm pretty sure there are other model kits squirreled away somewhere, I just couldn't find them. Uh, this is what was readily available, stuffed on shelves to keep them out of the way. So I have enough here to keep me busy for a good long time, and I plan to take advantage of that. The Workshop Wednesday videos will be coming back. Mostly it's armour kits, tanks, but there's a fair few science fiction bits and pieces there as well. Uh, mostly Star Wars, although I do have a 3D resin printed uh, Razor Crest from The Mandalorian. There's a couple of ships in there, I've got a Belfast and a Congo that need doing. And let's not forget my 3D printed M41A pulse rifle and motion tracker from Aliens, so I've got plenty to keep me occupied. But there's one project in particular that I bought a whole bunch of that stuff for, including uh, diorama and basic materials, that I never got around to doing until, well, far too late. And I wanted to do a sort of World War II North African desert campaign diorama. 
I've got a nice long base, which I'm obviously going to build up the North African terrain on. And at one end, there's going to be uh, a Vickers machine gun emplacement, a British six-pounder anti-tank gun, and a Bren gun carrier. At the other end, there's going to be a German armoured car. And in the middle, a whole bunch of German Africa Corps and British 8th Army soldiers duking it out. Um, that's definitely going to be one of the first videos that I do. Oh, I've also got a whole bunch of Games Workshop stuff as well, because of course I do. There's also a Warhammer 40k diorama I want to do, and I've never had the space required not just to do it, but also to display it. And hopefully, you know, that situation is going to change soon too. Ages ago, I got this diorama base from Forge World. I don't even think they sell them anymore. And it's absolutely huge. And one end of it is dominated by this Imperial emplacement with uh, trenches and sandbag walls and turrets and a big bunker door is set back into the cliff at the back of the base. And I wanted to have that set up as being defended by Imperial Guard with lines of guardsmen in the trenches and overlooking the sandbag walls and maybe get some mortar emplacements put in there and have the whole thing being swarmed by a horde of Tyranids. And I've got all of the models, it's just a question of having the time and the place to assemble them and paint them and put it all together and then actually display it. Um, I've also got some stuff from Forge World, some heavy mortar batteries, and I want to build a diorama with them in firing pits, all set up and ready to go. Like I said, I've got no shortage of stuff that I'm planning to do, but that's where the pile of shame comes from, isn't it? It's all the stuff that you buy with great intentions, but you never get around to doing. I've also got some very, very nice individual figures that I ordered from places like Black Sun Miniatures, Artel W. The kind of stuff that you paint to a very high standard as a display piece. Um, I've got no shortage of things to do, let's just put it that way. And I've been very, very good. I have seen other stuff since, and I thought, oh, that's a nice model, I must buy that. No, no. Reduce the pile of shame before you buy anything new. So that's the plan. And I'm very much looking forward to it. It's going to be really nice to have a dedicated space to uh, assemble and paint models in again. And I'm not going to waste the opportunity. Next question comes from Kaiser. This is a good question, actually. He says, Jingles, what kind of banter or rather criticism would you actually deem okay within the team chat of any given wargaming match? Is it okay to point out criticism as long as it's kept civil and not insulting? Where would you personally draw the line in regards to in-game chat interactions? It's a good question because one man's banter is another man's insult. And it's often, you know, within the medium of text communication, it's very difficult to imply tone. So... Somebody could be saying something that they think is obviously only intended as a joke and somebody else reading it might think, you cheeky bastard, there's no need for that. So I think it's difficult to know where to draw the line because text communication is not 100% reliable. That's why we have emojis, so you can indicate tone. You know, you put a little smiley face at the end, generally that means you're not serious, although you know there are obviously exceptions. Sometimes it just means you're being a sarcastic arsehole. But that's a perfect example. Even using emojis, it's not always straightforward to interpret tone and intention. And World of Warships and World of Tanks, for example, they don't even have emojis in text, although people improvise. 07, for example, is a salute, and so on and so on. But I think it's actually, there's a fairly simple solution to the whole problem. And it's down to you, because you know what your intentions are. And if you think, that you're being a bit of a dick or you're about to type something into chat and you think it might be a bit dickish it probably is so don't yeah when you step back and take a fresh look at the issue you strip away all the bullshit you can see how simple it actually is just observe rule number one at all times don't be a dick Final question today comes from Cardman GB. He says, Hello, Mr. Jingles. Just wondering, with the new season of Warship Life at Sea out on Channel 5, do you watch it? So, Channel 5 is a British TV station. I'd forgotten it existed, actually. <laughs> okay, to answer your question, Cardman. Uh, no, I don't watch it. I wasn't even aware that this TV show existed. It sounds like the sort of thing I probably would enjoy watching, but I do not have a television licence. And the reason I don't have a television license is because I do not need a television license. Because I don't watch terrestrial television. All I watch is Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, and YouTube. Oh, and I have the Channel 4 app as well for Channel 4 TV shows. 
but I do not have the BBC iPlayer. And if you do not receive a terrestrial television signal and you do not have the BBC iPlayer app, in this country you are not required to have a television license. And that's why, no, I've never even heard of Warship Life at Sea, and I definitely haven't watched it. Of course, the downside of not having a TV license here in the UK, even if by law you are not required to have one, if you're in the same circumstances as me, i.e. it is physically impossible for you because you don't have the required equipment to receive a BBC broadcast signal and you do not have the BBC iPlayer, that does not, of course, stop the TV licensing authority from hiring extremely obnoxious and aggressive bailiffs to come around on your doorstep and demand access to your property in order to verify that you're not watching the BBC illegally. The conversation usually starts with, good morning, good afternoon, sir, our records indicate that you do not own a TV license, is this correct? Yes, this is correct, I do not own a TV license. Well then, sir, we have reason to believe that you are watching television without a license and we require access to your property in order to verify that this is not the case. At which point you were perfectly within your rights to tell them to go forth and multiply, or words to that effect, because they have no legal right to enter your property and conduct a search. I could save myself the trouble of having to endure this every couple of months by just getting a TV licence, but I have too much fun telling the bailiffs to go and fuck themselves, <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah. What can I say? I'm old-fashioned like that. Anyway, that's about it for this week's episode of Meals with Jingles. Thanks for watching, I hope you've enjoyed it, and as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.